Good morning to all arts managers here with us today. I am Martin Lopez, welcoming you back to Crosslight Online Learning Sessions. Just like that, we are on week three. Last week, we learned about managing the arts and keeping artists empowered during the new normal. We were given an overview of arts management by Julie Kim Davis and Malaya Del Rosario from the British Council. They spoke about the online, out-of-the-box, multi-nation projects that the British Council implemented during quarantine. We learned about strategic leadership in the arts and how the arts continue to be relevant without spending too much from Mr. Chris Miliado of the Cultural Center of the Philippines. Finally, we learned about artist management and development from National University of Singapore's Miss Mary Law and how they are trying to work out the training and productions given the mobility issues and social distancing measures set by the government. As promised, we pick up from where we left off with not just one, but two parallel online sessions. If you are here in this room, you will hear about the practical side of art because it is more than just creating and performing. It is also about putting our work out there, making sure it reaches the right audience and maximizes the returns. Sounds daunting? Don't worry. I am sure you will pick up a lot by the end of this session. We will also be deviating from the usual sequence this week. Since our speakers come from different time zones, 
we will be conducting their open forums after their respective lectures. As you listen, please prepare to type your questions for that speaker in the Zoom chat box. Clear? All right, let's get the ball rolling. Our first speaker is a stalwart in the Asian American theater scene. His works have been staged in acclaimed venues such as the Public Theater, Long Wharf Theater, Laguna Playhouse, Victory Gardens, La Mama, the Children's Theater Company, Vineyard Theater, and many more. His recent directorial credits include Once Upon a Korean Time, The Wong Kids, Micro Crisis, Among the Dead, The Chinese Lady, Felix Taro, and the upcoming short film, Vancouver. He is also founder and artistic director of the Mayi Theatre Company and recently won an Obi, the off-Broadway equivalent of the Tony Award. Nowadays, the terms digital marketing and social media management are all the rage, especially at a time when consumers are more reliant on gadgets more than ever, even more for creative products and services. More and more job opportunities have sprouted from these relatively new fields in lieu of those jobs which are heavily reliant on face-to-face -face interactions. I am sure you will have a lot of questions to ask him after his sharing as to how they were able to turn things around at Mai Theater. Get ready to submit those questions via the chat box. Here to give us an overview on these topics from the point of view of an artist, please welcome Mr. Ralph Pena. Hello, my name is Ralph Pena and I am one of the founders and the current artistic director of Mai Theatre Company, a nonprofit theater based in New York City. We, we recently celebrated our 30th anniversary season, which was unfortunately cut short in March 2020, when all theaters in the United States and actually in the entire world uh, were shut down by the pandemic. Uh, it was a critical time for all theaters, large and small, and there were those who believed that the shutdown would only take a few months. I didn't think that, and we thought it would take up to two years, uh, if not longer. And at the time, it was vital to find ways to engage with both our artists and our audiences. Uh, we knew there would be no work for theaters, uh, from actors to stage to stage hands to ushers to box office managers, and with the economy in freefall. Our audiences, uh, we can't expect our audiences to prioritize theater over rent, food, and basic necessities. Very quickly, we needed a way to employ as many artists and craftspersons as possible uh, while offering free, accessible programming to our communities. Uh, a little background. In the United States, this thinking is considered heresy. Since the late 80s, when the National Endowment for the Arts was decimated by conservative politics, not-for-profit arts organizations and theaters transformed themselves into quasi-commercial businesses whose survival depended on one, ticket sales, and two, private donations. Without these sources of revenue, it was nearly impossible to survive on government help alone. This pandemic immediately killed ticket sales. It also adversely affected private donations when our traditional donors redirected their support to healthcare and medical concerns, and rightfully so, because that was the bigger need at the time. And to give you an example of the impact of that kind of redirection of resources, uh, the Children's Theatre Company, with whom we 
frequently collaborate, it's based in Minneapolis, and they saw their budget plummet from $13.5 million to $4 million, and its staff reduced from 80 to 25. And uh, another example is at the, at the renowned public theater, which, as you know, birthed uh, the mega musical Hamilton. Their budget plunged from 60 million to 29 million as revenues declined by two thirds. And they had a staff of 270 that was dropped to 70. Uh, and this doesn't include uh, the additional 2,500 people the public employs as independent contractors in an average year. Just about every theater relies heavily on freelancers, but no one could do anything to help them financially. So we had massive layoffs. Uh, it wasn't any different for my theater company. Although we closed two of our shows, we committed to paying in full all of our contracts to artists, designers, directors, crew, and outside contractors. This was a, for a small theater company like ours, it was a very big step. We knew we were no longer going to be able to collect revenue, we couldn't sell tickets, but it was important for us to pay the artists in full, even if they'd, we, we closed the show early. Um, and to do this, we tapped into our cash reserves. And I got the board, or I went to the board, and asked them to release money from our restricted endowment so that we can pay people, essentially. And at the time, this was really the goal. It was more important to pay artists than anything else. And our mantra at the time was, Let's figure out how to pay for this later. Let's pay them now, and then we'll figure out what we do with our debt. That was the that was our way of thinking at the time. Uh, we decided to build a live capture studio to allow us to pivot to an all digital format. This is a very big decision for a theater company, a live theater company, and a small live theater company like ours to suddenly move from live performances to digital um, and we did it was something we knew um, we had to do immediately uh, but for which we didn't have the resources um, at the time we didn't really know what switching to a digital format meant we had never produced film or television and didn't know anything about building a studio so the first thing we did was we hired consultants to guide us in the purchasing of the equipment, what we needed, uh, and a new broadcast platform that wasn't Zoom because Zoom was so limiting and you can only use boxes. Uh, we decided to invent on something um, that was brand new. And then they needed to train us and our staff on the use of this new equipment. Uh, of course, none of this was going to be for free. So the first order of business was to raise the money for this digital conversion. Mm, luckily for us, we were one of the first theaters in the United States to commit to this switch. So we attracted the attention of foundations uh, who were looking for ways to help the theater community in the United States. Uh, long story short we got the money and by july 2020 we had built a digital studio and we had a new digital platform that we decided to call my Yi studios hello my name is ralph pena and i'm the artistic director of my Yi theater company in new york city and this this is our new broadcast studio and we're calling it my Yi studio live a lot has happened when this pandemic broke and much of what we do every day changed. With the closure of theaters and live performance venues, we can't be in the same room to experience stories together. So we had to quickly figure out how to keep in touch with you and to give our artists the tools they need to create and find employment. That's really what's behind all this. We need to take care of artists during these very difficult times. 
we need to give them a reason to stay in the city, to continue to challenge our ways of thinking, and to show us new perspectives about what all of this means. This is how we will continue to stay in touch, through short films, live broadcasts of plays, features, editorials, music, readings, you name it. We've never done this before, but it feels like we're at a juncture where we're all being asked to try things we've never done before. And we hope you'll stay with us on this new journey as you have through the years. Not only because you play a vital role in keeping theater alive, but also because it wouldn't be much fun without you. Thank you. Artists come first. We're here to talk about marketing, but before we get to the business of selling art, we have to look at how art is made and ensure that we have equitable practices in place at every juncture of art making. We have to provide safe spaces for artists to create. And by safe spaces, I mean both literal and emotional spaces where artists are free from threats, exploitation, and harassment. We must protect traditionally disenfranchised communities from marginalization. And I'm speaking of the, the disabled, the indigenous communities, transgender, and communities of color that are often excluded from your usual power structures in theater making. And we must, must, must pay the artists a living wage. I cannot, I cannot emphasize that enough. I am very aware of what happens in nonprofit or community-based projects where everyone is working for the love of theater. I know about the beg, steal, or borrow economy. It has its place in the theater-making ecology. Much of theater around the world relies on this model. However, it's a model that needs to be changed. If we continue to think of theater as a free commodity, then we will continue to participate in the exploitation of artists. Whatever the scale of the show, uh, there must be a way to equitably share and distribute resources. Transparency is a key component of an equitable practice. What do I mean by transparency? Uh, we show uh, our budget to all the artists so that everyone knows where the money is going. And we build consensus around why the money is distributed a certain way. Everyone knows how much people are paid. And for us, this is a radical practice. Um, there are no secrets about how much one person is getting or the other person is getting or why, for example, we are spending so much money on lights or sets or rentals. All the artists know uh, how that money is distributed, and we have buy-in from the artists. They help decide, we need more money here, we need to pay this person more, and so um, uh, it becomes a more equitable practice by simply being transparent about resources. Um, this is a practice that is now gaining more and more traction uh, amongst theaters in the United States, or at least here in New York, but it's becoming more and more common. If we're going to market art as a commodity or a consumer product, we have to make sure we are not complicit in the exploitation of artist labor. And I've said this before, artists and theater workers must be protected and most importantly, they must be paid. There's a difference between marketing in the digital world and marketing digital art. 
uh, we're already using digital platforms for marketing like uh, selling tickets and creating tailored consumer experiences online. Digital marketing can cover uh, creating and executing a marketing strategy, uh, developing a marketing campaign, creating a user acquisition strategy, uh, digital advertising, content marketing, retention strategy, and SEO or search engine optimization. Uh, not every arts organization or theater company will need these tools to engage with users and audiences, but it is important to understand every component so you can create a tailored approach to your marketing program. So what's a marketing strategy? Uh, a marketing strategy is your overall plan to engage with consumers and your audience. It's focused on high level brand development and you, you can think of it as your general battle plan. A marketing campaign is the tactical and operational actions you create to deliver specific results that support your marketing strategy. It should clearly define the what, when, how, and why of every action you take. As an example, a, com a campaign will address what you're selling, when you're going to start selling it, how you plan to sell it, and why you're selling it in the first place. All of these things may seem like self-evident uh, metrics, but you'd be surprised how often marketing campaigns make incorrect assumptions because everyone assumes every team member is clear about the strategy. What are the components of a marketing strategy? First, it has to have clearly defined goals. Um, you have to have realistic ways to measure success. You have to do your research and you have to tailor your campaign to your audience or your market segment and media platform. And you have to engage with your audiences emotionally and intellectually and create a timeline with milestones and deliverables. Let's talk about clearly defined goals. Your marketing campaign always must always tie to your organization, organizational vision and mission. As a theater company, for example, I don't sell shoes. Uh, so make sure your campaign is aligned with the company's brand. Define what success means to you. What metrics are you going to use to measure the success of the campaign? You should use quantifiable measures and not just intuition or word of mouth. By quantifiable, I mean data, real hard data that you can analyze. Uh, if you're using social media, for example, to launch a campaign, uh, measure the number of views or the clicks, engagements, comments, and market segmentation. Uh, if you're using your own web portal for the campaign, make sure you have tools in place to measure all those things. You know, how many users logged in, when did they log in, etc., etc. You need all of that hard data. And then you analyze those two and you look for correlations between uh, platform engagement and sales. Um, for example, in our case, we determined that we get the best engagement on Facebook when we post on Mondays at 8 p.m. New York time. And this is when people are getting home and logging onto their social media accounts. It's also when we sell the most number of tickets. You have to do research. You have to take deep dives into your market research to understand the specific needs of your audiences. This is something that you cannot take for granted and for which you will need consumer data. This is what I talked about, um, gathering all of these data points from your social media accounts or your uh, web portals. In our case, uh, over the past five years, we have worked with marketing consultants who advised us to subscribe to Experience Mosaic platform to get specific consumer data. Experian is one of the uh, credit companies uh, in the United States, the one of the biggest, uh, and they collect consumer data 
from everyone who use every time someone uses their credit card and every time someone gets a loan their banks all of that they call it big data basically all of that is uh put together or compiled by experian and they start running analysis on it but by subscribing to their data analysis tools we're able to look at our ticket buyers and know their income brackets whether they own their own homes how much disposable income they have what what they spent their uh, uh, disposable income uh, on if they go to movies if they go to resorts uh, what kind of cars they drive when where they went to school etc etc we get a complete profile on every consumer let me clarify that if someone buys a ticket from my theater company using their credit card obviously we get their information uh, their address etc etc uh, and their names that is then run through the Experian database and we get all the consumer information related to that name that address that phone number and that credit card uh, it's scary but that that information is readily available we do not get their social security numbers or or their bank info no we only get the uh, match with the name the address the phone number and maybe the credit card and then we get all the other stuff like do they own their homes what kind of cars they drive etc 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 uh, it's scary to think you know how much information is out there about you but this is now the world we live in uh, so when we began this kind of analysis, we found out that those who were buying full price tickets from our uh, for our shows are aged between 30 and 50 years old. They are college graduates, uh, and they mostly live on the Upper East and West sides of Manhattan in New York. And this group of people turned out to be our primary market. Okay, so now we know who our primary market is, the people that are buying full price tickets, the ones that are basically um, giving us our earned revenue numbers. Uh, and knowing that is absolutely critical and you have, to, you have to understand that as part of your marketing strategy. Except, and this is a very big except, uh, you must also look to your mission uh, to make sure that your goals are aligned with your campaigns. And while this uh, primary market of 30 to 50 year olds up living in the Upper East and West Side of Manhattan's, uh, Manhattan and um, college educated, this market is not necessarily our desired market. Uh, for a company like ours, whose mission is to serve the Asian American communities of New York, we have to and we must reach out to communities in the outer boroughs, not just in the upper east and west sides of Manhattan. We need to reach low-income families, seniors, students, and most especially new immigrant communities, those that are uh, first-generation uh, immigrants to the United States who are generally excluded 
from any kind of arts programming uh, uh, in the United States or in, within New York City. They, they're simply not catered to. My name is Lloyd Sa. I am a co-director of the Mai Writers Lab, and Art New York provides us with this wonderful office space, um, which the Mai Writers Lab uses to generate new works, have our meetings, all that kind of stuff. Let's have a look. Say hello, everybody. And that's where new Asian American plays come from. So while, while we're selling full price tickets to the upper middle class of New York City, our marketing campaigns are also directed to attracting our desired market segments by providing, uh, providing access to free tickets and most importantly, going to these communities to partner with service organizations already working uh, with these communities already on the ground. For example, uh, we hold potluck meetings with at-risk youth counselors in Queens to understand how we can serve the needs of these teenagers and keep them out of gangs. Uh, we've been doing this several years now and we have come to uh, get to know this community of at-risk youth and their immigrant parents. And one way we have been able to serve this community is by holding workshops, after-school workshops or after-school basketball games or anything like that to keep them uh, from joining gangs. Uh, except, and also it's not enough to just give away tickets. You have to engage. You have to be with them, you have to listen to them, uh, and you have to follow up to create long-term relationships with these communities. It's not enough to just go there and hand out free tickets. They come to your show, they go home, and end of story. No, uh, this is a long-term relationship. You invest in the long-term relationship because the most important um, aspect of that relationship you have with your audiences is trust. And that's a big word I know, but trust uh, is something you earn. Uh, and you can't do that by simply giving away comps. When you create a campaign strategy, some of the things you have to think about are what do you want and how will you get it? what platforms will you use and which ones will be most effective. Uh, for example, for us, uh, Facebook has a limited audience in the United States when it comes to art consumption. Facebook doesn't have the same market draw that it used to. Now that uh, you know it's, it's embroiled in controversy and facing a lot of legal troubles, it's also uh, been criticized for allowing all kinds of uh, fake news sources to post on Facebook. So people have sort of moved away from that. Instead, um, we use Twitter and Instagram, which allows us to get to our millennial users. They're our younger audience. These are the folks that are aged from like 18 to 30. Uh, they are heavily or heavy users of Twitter and Instagram. And we have found that the best way to reach these folks are uh, is through those, those two platforms. We, the campaigns that we develop for Twitter and for Instagram are all tailored to the demographics of our audiences. Uh, Twitter, Instagram, our audience is between, 20, uh, like I said, 18 to 30. And this is where market research is invaluable. You need to know what gets their attention, the buzzwords and all the memes maybe and moment and, and of the moment images they respond to. You, you won't know that. I certainly won't know that. I'm too old. 
uh, but we have staff members and we have consultants who understand the millennial or even, I don't know what's after millennial, but the millennial audiences, what they respond to and what they want. And so our ad campaigns are tailored to them. Uh, sadly, I think I'm out of time. Um, it's not, I have to say, it's not easy just talking to a camera with no one to really uh, respond to you. So I'm going to be, I think, much more effective responding or answering your questions. So I, you know, I, I want to reserve a time to sort of hear from you or uh, answer specific questions. So uh, thank you for having me and I look forward to a QA. and a Wow, that was a very comprehensive overview on a very timely, not to mention very useful topic. It makes me wish we had a whole separate webinar series just for that. That actually would be an idea, don't you think? Uh, so shout out to the uh, organizers that maybe we can include this topic in a future conference. May we request Mr. Pena to turn on his camera for the open forum. Hi, greetings from Manila. Hi, hello. How would you like me to address you? Ralph, Ralph is fine. Okay. Hi, Ralph, so I'm Martin. Hi. How are things in New York? Uh, they're, they're okay. You know, we're starting to reopen theater has announced a return um, as early as September. Broadway has announced a return as early as September. Uh, all the other, the smaller theaters are going to follow in the fall, but right now we still don't know what the rules are um, that, that, that the unions will impose because they have their own rules for the, how their actors are going to be kept safe, et cetera, et cetera. And we have a legal issue here about um, requiring people to show their vaccination status. So that's all in the courts now. But I, I think in starting in the fall, you're going to start seeing um, theater activity again, maybe in limited capacity, but there will be some. That's very encouraging. And we hope that here in the Asian region, we'll be able to follow suit. And we'll probably yeah. gain a lot of tips from what's happening in New York and <laughs> elsewhere, hopefully, hopefully. But yeah. uh, your presentation was actually very, very interesting, very enlightening, very encouraging. And uh, thank you for that. And Welcome. we do have uh, a few questions already from our audience, uh, both on Zoom and on Facebook. We encourage all of you out there to keep uh, the questions coming and to make the most of this uh, really special time that we have with with Ralph. Uh, to start with, we have a question from Randy Nobleza, who is in um, Marinduque, I believe, here in the Philippines. And his question is, uh, hello, Sir Ralph, compared to a streaming service like Netflix, what are the key differences and advantages of your process flow in Mayi? And how would you describe the average theater goers during the normal, the new normal era? Well, first of all, scale, you know, uh, Netflix is a global behemoth with hundreds of millions of users. And we are a theater company who started streaming only because we couldn't perform live. So that's the first difference. And the second process wise is we're probably quicker on our feet than Netflix because we can come up with a video in a week. Um, from start to finish, and Netflix can't do that yet. So we're able to respond um, a quick, quicker to the stuff that's happening with our audiences, but it's very direct, you know? So I don't have, actually, uh, since we started streaming, we have, uh, our, our global audience is around 3 million, and that is insane. 
uh, an insane amount of audiences around the world. Um, there's a lot of it in the Philippines, a lot of it in Singapore, Hong Kong, India, uh, England, Australia, the Middle East. So these are places we've never reached before. And so that's, that's been a, a, a real, real um, eye opener for us. And in reopening theater in New York, I don't wanna give that up. So I'm talking to the unions, we all are, to see how we can now do a hybrid of live and digital performance. Um, we don't know if that, how that's going to work out, but that's a key difference I think between Netflix and us is this is not our main activity. We're a theater company. Um, and the audiences at the beginning of the pandemic loved all of the streaming services, but that is now tapered off. A lot of our, a lot of the audiences that used to consume digital data are no longer doing that because um, now they can go out uh, and have dinner. They can go watch a movie. So the appetite for uh, digital streaming, at least from our end and not Netflix, okay? Um, for, for theaters and all the other people that are creating digital content, that has really gone down. To piggyback on that answer of yours, now that you realize that there is a global demand actually for your productions, does that mean that when you market or you create marketing materials, you will keep that in mind or that you will create separate materials for these global audiences too? I think the answer is both. Uh, if we can do both, we will do both. Right now, our proposition to the unions, uh, the theatrical unions, is that we are able to record the productions at the very beginning of the run and broadcast it. Or they allow us to do live broadcasts two days a week. Um, so there's a lot of, still too much unknown. But I, of all the theaters, all the, I talk to the theaters around New York all the time and we're all very much interested in that uh, hybrid model so that we can maintain the global audience that we've been able to reach in the last year and a half. The unions you mentioned seem to be a very powerful force in determining policies in theater, I guess, not just in New York, but around the US. Is it? Um, yes, they're there to they're, they protect workers' rights though. And so they're, they're critical. Otherwise, uh, you know, artists are already exploited. They are exploited all the time. And I can tell you in the Philippines, that is very much the case because nobody pays those actors enough to make a living. And I have many friends there who ended up selling, uh, what do you call Ooh. these? Uh, bananas on a stick just so to make ends meet. I mean, that's, not, that's no good. So um, that happened here too, but not to that scale. So the unions protect the artists to make sure that we're paying them a living wage. We're not exploiting them. We're not overworking them. So yes, they're very powerful, especially in New York City, which is a very liberal town. Um, the unions carry a lot of power, but they do that same thing in LA. The movie unions are all the same, same thing in England. Uh, so the unions are there for a reason. Thank you. We now have a question from Davao in yeah. here also in the Philippines. It's from Jess Montajes of the Ateneo de Davao University Culture and Arts Cluster. Mm -hmm. Since you highlight art marketing, specifically, mm -hmm the utilization of digital platforms. Do we have a specific tool engaging the level of success for virtual events aside from a well-designed marketing plan? Uh, for here, here, we have consultants again, and we bought the tools to make that happen. Like I said, Experian Mosaic allows us to analyze, not just, we get all the data, but without analysis, they mean nothing. And this is how we're able to see who buys our tickets, when they buy it, what their ages are, where they live, et cetera, and all of that. And we're able to craft a marketing campaign also. So now we, our marketing campaigns are targeted, right? So we do it for the millennials and we're able to measure the responses um, uh, from engagement with the posts, from uh, direct um, feedback, because we always have community meetings but also through sales. So 
there's feedback, there's market uh, feedback that we get that we incorporate into the marketing uh, strategy going forward. So it's it's a, it's a it's a what do you call this? Is a dynamic relationship between us and our audiences and marketing. And marketing can all, ha, always has to be dynamic. So and you have to start uh, looking at new tools uh, to measure these things because technology is evolving. Um, so yeah, so it's a constant thing, you know, it's a constant uh, uh, analysis on our part, but you know, we've already gotten help. We have, we have consultants who help us with this because we're artists, you know, and marketing should, it's not my thing. Uh, so I need help and the staff needs help uh, and we're able to do that. We have a question now from Mary Law of the National University of Singapore. Ties in just with what you said, a company like Mai has access to consultants, she says. What advice can you give to arts managers in educational institutions as to how they can get that kind of information? You can reach out to people like us. Um, you know, the, the world has gotten a lot smaller and I think the pandemic has brought that home. Um, you can reach out to theater companies anywhere around the world, uh, just if you get their, you know, their own websites and, and ask. Um, you're not going to get anything unless you ask. And I, I, I can guarantee you that as artists or this companies, they will respond to these kinds of requests. Um, because we all know what world we're living in. We all know that every artist, every organization, arts organization in the world is suffering. So uh, now is the time to be, to be asking that. And you have to do that hand in hand with asking your government and your country and your uh, communities to support your work. You can't, you have to do both. You gotta go reach out to others, but you also have to cultivate your base and, um, and advocate for yourself, especially on the government levels. In Asia, I'm, you know, I'm familiar with the Philippines. You have to advocate for arts funding from the government. They need to support the arts. It's not enough. It's certainly not enough. Uh, so hopefully that and answers that. Here now is a question from a government institution from the Pamantasan ng Lunsod ng Marikina, Elenita Cruz asks if you encountered any copyright issues now more than during live performances. Yes, for sure. Uh, copyright issues, intellectual properties and all that becomes very much an issue when you are streaming. Um, and because of course you can't really control your market because um, we don't, you know, it's out there. Once you put something on the internet, out on the internet, it's there forever. So you have to protect those things. And we had to go through all the multiple unions and sign contracts, uh, not just with the theatrical unions, but with television and film, because now we're streaming. So uh, we have to secure copyright, um, copyright permission from all the artists involved. That includes writers, directors, designers, any picture that we use, any clip, anything, even location releases. It's the, it's the same thing. We, uh, the, the, the rights are absolutely the first thing you have to secure. Do you have an office that does that? Sorry, do you have, do you have, uh, uh, do you have an office within Mai who handles copyright requests. Yes, and we have a we have a law firm um, that does pro bono work with us that handles all of our intellectual property stuff. But generally, the one way to get around all of that stuff is that to, to use only original material, which we're also able to do because we have a stable of musicians, art, uh, actors, playwrights, actors, uh, which we can do and not have any issue that way. But if we if we end up using existing material, then the lawyers have to get involved. And interesting enough, we will have as one of our speakers later, attorney Christopher Cruz of De La Salle University, who will talk to us more about intellectual property. So yeah. uh, if we can't answer those questions about copyright now in this session, please save them for attorney Cruz later. Yeah, you um, want to ask about fair use. <laughs> we have a question again from Jess 
of Ateneo de Davao University for post evaluation of online events. Can we still utilize SWOT analyses or is there any other existing post project review mechanism? Um, uh, you can, you can, but I think, you know, those old, that, that, the old models of doing analysis like that still certainly apply, but you're now dealing with a different media and you need to really look at um, new tools to help you um, sort of navigate this new, this new medium. It's not, um, you know, it's not, you know, we're not selling uh, we're not doing, well, we're not, we're not doing TV ads. We're not doing, we're not selling any of those consumer products. So uh, it's a lot more fluid and it's, it's constant because we, the data comes back and you sort of have to understand how to do that. But SWOT analysis is still there. I mean, you should be able to employ all those tools uh, uh, in your, in your, in analyzing your uh, market penetration, market, um, uh, what do you call this? Results, you can, you can do that. Um, also, if you do a SWOT thing, I think that's really um, an internal look at your, more at your organization. Uh, and you should have been, you know, that, that should have been, that's sort of separate from like what how you're analyzing your market data. Uh, yeah, I mean, you, yeah, you can look at that. Uh, you know, we, we do all of that stuff, but I, I you know, none, none of our consultants are focused on SWOT analysis. Um, they're looking at uh, uh, consumer trends. Would that also determine then the nature of a particular production, whether it's a musical or comedy, um, the, the theme yeah. of a particular play or for some a season? For some theaters, yes, they will program according to their market data. I do the, I don't do it that way. I program first and then create the strategy. So otherwise, I, the market is not telling me what to do. Um, I am doing it to serve my community and the artists, and then finding the market uh, after the fact, after I've already chosen the material. And that's where brand plays a huge uh, role. Because when I sell tickets, they're not buying a ticket to the playwright or to the actor that's on stage. They're buying a ticket because they know the Mayi brand. Um, because we're a nonprofit and we're supposed to be serving artists. So I can't, you know, I'm not going to do King and I because I think it's going to sell, right? I'm going to do a play that actually means something right now. People are beating up Asians in the United States. I want a play that addresses that problem and not do a musical. Just to take it a little bit further, how do you program your season? Like, do you... Um, have a common theme for the productions or is it no the... no we have a community of artists we have a stable we have a the right with the largest writers lab of asian american playwrights in the united states we have a huge network of artists and we con constantly talk what are you working on what do you want to work on what's going on and that process can take anywhere from one to seven years uh that's the last video that i show k-pop was a huge, uh, took us seven years to do, but now it's going to Broadway. So we didn't program that <laughs> because we wanted to go to Broadway. We wanted to show the United States at the time, we opened that, I don't know, five years ago, that K-pop is a worldwide phenomenon. Uh, and now of course that thinking is just now beginning to hit the United States where it's been you know, the case in Asia. You guys have been talking about BTS forever that's just hitting the US market. So, so, so we, we choose the material based on what we think uh, our community wants. And my community, I mean, our community of artists in the Asian American community, right, of New York, and not be what the market says we should do. Because if I did that, I would only do King and I yeah. or South Pacific 
or Miss Saigon. That's all I would ever do, <laughs> but I'm not interested in those things. I would love to ask more questions, but uh, yeah. we unfortunately have just time for one last, and it will be okay. from Alvaro Joquino Jr., who is the head of the Arts and Culture Office in the Dalubhasaan ng Lunsod ng San Pablo City, Laguna, in the Philippines. Do you do lock-in rehearsals? And then how long per lock-in session, if so? And how much is the additional program cost with a new setup? No, we didn't do that. Although some began to do that recently. Um, and the, the, I know that the lockdown was 15 days uh, before you can start working. And then the union requires three swab tests a week um, during the lockdown and then during the filming. Um, what we did instead was we bought digital uh, roving TV kits that we could send out to actors uh, with green screen, all that stuff, so that that's how we shot our digital work. Um, the lockdown is not easy to accomplish. Uh, first of all, a Broadway production will have 200 people in it and uh, from crew to the actor. So to, to, to do that, it's an extremely expensive proposition. The few that I've known are schools um, because as you know, the graduation was last month. And so they had to do all their showcases and they locked themselves up for two weeks and then did the, sh the shoot. But, but because of the pandemic, we are no longer, we're only going to rehearse five days a week, six hours a day. And we're going to eliminate those 12 hour uh, tech times. So that is going to add 20% to our production costs going forward. Um, and, have, and our estimate is that there could be another 5% added to production costs for uh, COVID mitigation. Um, in the United States, they are requiring theaters to redo their HVAC systems. Uh, so that is a huge cost, but we all think that it's about 25% more. Wow, that means also more fundraising on your part. Well, yes, some of us are saying instead of doing three shows a season or four shows a season, we would only do two until we figure out how much more this thing will cost. Well, you know, again, I wish there was more time to um, continue asking questions because you have been so informative and so generous with your time and with your answers. Um, we can't help but be in awe with your contributions to the Asian American theater scene and more importantly, for all your hard work in responding to the circumstances. Thank Before you. I mean... Since it is getting late in New York, we would like to take a moment to present the certificate as a token of our appreciation. May we request our AUNCA chair, Ms. Glorife Samodio, to turn on her camera for the awarding of certificates to our speaker. Hi, thank you, Ralph. That's the one communicating with you. <laughs> yes, I know. Thank you for having me. <laughs> yeah, thanks. So the certificate that will be presented reads the ASEAN University Network, ASEAN University Network on Culture and the Arts, Commission on Higher Education, and the Association of Cultural Offices and Philippine Educational Institutions, Inc. present the certificate of appreciation to Mr. Ralph Pena for generously sharing his insights as a parallel speaker on the topic marketing creative products and services in the digital world under the theme managing the arts and empowering young artists in the new normal part two for the AUNCA's Crosslight online learning session day three given virtually this 18th day of June 2021 signed by Ms. Glorife Samuelio, AUNCA chair and Dr. Troltis Dirathiti, AUN Executive Director. Thank you all very much.
May we also request everyone to turn on their cameras so we can capture this special moment with Mr. Pena. Great. Thank you once again, Ralph. We hope that we will have more opportunities to collaborate with you in the future. Yes, yes. We <clears throat> reach out to all the theaters around the world. I'm sure they'll be very receptive. That'd be wonderful. But okay, thank you. Good night. Good night. Oh, good morning. Good night. <laughs> good night for you. Bye bye. Hey, thank you. All right. All of you in the audience can now turn off your cameras as we go on a quick break. When we return, we will be meeting our second speaker. Please stay with us. AUNCA and ACOBE's Crosslight Online Learning Sessions will be back in a few minutes.
Welcome back. In case you just joined us, this is week three of the AUNCA and ACOPACE Crosslight Online Learning Sessions. This is one of two webinars happening simultaneously at this moment. Before the break, we got a glimpse of the latest developments in the Asian American theater scene courtesy of Mr. Ralph Pena. For our next talk, we will cross the Atlantic and head to the United Kingdom. Our second speaker is a journalist whose expansive body of work includes interviews, news stories, and feature writing covering a variety of topics from styling and creative direction to business management. She since forayed into the academe as a PhD researcher at the University for the Create Arts Business School and as an associate lecturer on the leadership and management program at the London College of Fashion, UAL. The University of the Arts London is a world top two university for art and design according to the QS World University Rankings and Europe's largest specialist university for art and design. On top of all that, she stays in touch with her journalistic roots as founder and editor-in-chief of the leadership and style platform edithher.com. With a resume as impressive as hers, surely she can teach us a number of things about adding value to and even selling our work. At a time we all had to learn to be self-sustaining creatives at some point, it is a skill we all had to acquire one way or the other, so we can also spread the word to the young artists under our care. To teach us about monetizing our creative products and services, all the way from the United Kingdom, is Miss Sakina Hunter. Hi all, welcome. I'm so glad to be here at this exciting Crosslight Festival today. It's a great event and it's filled with lots of inspiring um, creatives. So yeah, super excited to be here. I'm Sakena Hunter, so I'll just start with a brief introduction. I'm a journalist and the founder and editor-in-chief of Edit Her aka edithair.com, which is a woman's leadership and style online platform, um, aka magazine, and we cover business, psychology, fashion and life. So yeah, that's a little bit about me and I'm going to kick off this session talking about how to monetize your creative services and products, which is especially important considering the recent times that we've been having with the pandemic and lockdowns and the whole situation around that. So we need to be the more resilient and more um, innovative in the way that we approach, you know, creating these services um, for online. So yeah, so super excited to be here. So um, I'm going to kick off now. So yes, I'll first start by talking about Edit Her and the edithair.com platform. So when it comes to really, you know, creating, building a platform to show off your services, it's so important to invest in a good creative team. So mine started with investing in a graphic designer um, because I wanted her to, you know, develop all of the visuals that I had put on a mood board and really put them into put them into real life. So really just translate all that I had, you know, given her in terms of my vision. And, you know, cause I created a website based off a really, really clear vision. And it all started with a mood board that I'd done on Pinterest. So I would really recommend um, all of you, you know, if you haven't already to really start formulating these mood boards that really show off what you want to, what you want your website to look like. And to, yeah, translate this vision to your creative team. Um, and by no means this is going to be a straight line. There's going to be a lot of curveballs, a lot of, you know, different decisions being made. Yes to this, no to this, you know, coming back on things. Um, and it started off with uh, a few mock-ups. So mock-ups of what I had, you know, looked at, decided on. Um, there was a few different options that I had to choose from. So, yeah, so I would definitely say number one is to really start understanding how you want your platform to look. 
And this is Edit Her, essentially, edithere.com. And for me, it was really important to, you know, pull out the key kind of keywords that we're trying to represent with the brand, um, which I would recommend you to do as well. So for us, because it's women's leadership and style, women's style and power were the three words that I really wanted to come across. And it was important for them to be highlighted and to stand out on the page, which is why you can see that they're in like a deep red color on the page. And I'll actually show you now the actual website so you can see. So this is edithere.com. And as you can see, as I've mentioned, so we've got some key sections so we've got leadership, fashion, psychology, and life. And as you can see, we've got the three highlighted um, keywords. It was really important to pull out space and to really create that, you know, that great white space so that all of the key elements on the page stand out. Because there's so much space, um, you can really see the article headlines, the images, and those are the things that I really want to stand out. So I think, you know, whether you want to be really minimal in your design aesthetic, or if you want to be a bit more, you know, play a bit more crazy with colors and, and designs, it's just up to you. And it's, it's up to, you know, the audience that you're trying to target because I was trying to target style conscious women who, you know, are trying to navigate their careers, navigate life, and also, um, yeah, they really do care about their, their sensibility, their fashion sense. So it was really important to have this kind of playful, fun um, aesthetic going on here. And I think that's why when you've, you know, you've really honed in on how you want it to look, things will start to, you know, play into, into how you want them to, basically. So um, I'll stop sharing my screen. Another key thing is really figuring out how you're going to make your, you know, your business and your products, how you're going to make them reach people from different avenues. So for me, it was really important to create a newsletter so that I could constantly keep all of my readers, my visitors up to date with the new content on the website. And I think a newsletter is a really great way, for example, if you're running a service and you really want to keep people, you know, up to date with news or anything around the services that you're offering, I really do think a, a website like MailChimp, which is what I currently use, um, would be great to, you know, do regular newsletters. And I think it's kind of towing the line between not creating too many newsletters so that it bombards your, you know, your users, your readers. It, you don't want it to bombard their inbox, but you want to still keep up that conversation. So it's about how do you keep up that conversation when they're not around and when they're maybe not on your, your website or they're not checking out your products. You know, you might give them a little bit of an alert by, by doing these newsletters. So, you know, using language like subscribe, sign up to get all our latest news straight to your inbox is just a really um, great way of inviting them to, you know, check in on your content more than just when they expect to, to check in on it. And we have, obviously, we have an email address, which you can see at the bottom, newsletter at edither.com. And this is the email that will come through into their inbox when they subscribe. So, and that brings me to my next point is that I think it's so important for you to have, you know, this kind of branding throughout your business so if you've got your the name of your website you really want to have the email addresses that kind of um, resonate with that and you want to maybe have more than just one uh, email address so you might have one that people can address you directly to and then you'll have you know one where people can get updates like the newsletter and then you might have one for PR or something like that so you know just that kind of normal I would say uh, way of doing things when it comes to contacting people and for having them contact you as well so um, so as you can see I'll quickly show you how it looks on the website as well so when you do come down um, on the website it's really easy you just type in your name and so forth and subscribe and it's just super super simple so that's a really great way to just keep people um, looking at your content seeing your new services seeing what products are out there and you might find that they you know send you messages um, comment on your social media platforms more because they're constantly keeping up to date with everything so um, yeah that's super important 
So I'll come off this. And then also, um, it's so key to have, as I said, that it's so key to have different avenues of um, how you share your products and how you share your services. So for instance, we have a blog section on the website and it's separate, but also, you know, resonates really well with the, the main category content. So it's separate, but not separate in a way. So when you go onto the blog, Again, you can see this a lots of space that so really highlights all the different articles and the, the, the content and the imagery. Um, so it's really easy for people to see it straight away and it's what catches your eye. So that's the, the most important thing. So just as I mentioned the newsletter, so this is a snapshot of what the kinds of content that we would have in the newsletter. So it's about SEO using really smart SEO. And I think it's really important as creatives that we, there's a bit of a balance. So we use words that are creative, that feel authentic, that feel natural, and that really show off our services. But then we also pay attention to search engine optimization and pulling out those keywords. So really pulling out those keywords that are going to, you know, create some kind of buzz around what you're providing and really reach the people that you want it to reach and maybe reach even people that you didn't expect it to reach, but that are very in line with what you are offering and what you want to showcase. So for instance, for this email, this particular email, which was a really recent one. Um, so the subject line was really, it really pulled out the key features of the email. And then we've got this kind of headline, new this week, women's leadership and style. You instantly know what it's about. People that are interested in women's leadership and interested in style, they're gonna immediately think, oh, this is for me. Um, and obviously because they've subscribed to your website anyway, you want to make sure that you're using really um, consistent language, but still language that feels fresh and that feels exciting and that feels um, innovative. Um, and then, yeah, so I would pull out like a key part of the um, feature. So for instance, we run a regular series called A Day in the Life, where we interview, you know, really pioneering women in creative fields, in business fields, in different kinds of industries that are really inspiring. And for this particular email, I said A Day in the Life, and then I've called out her name and I've literally just listed her title and I've said, you know, read now. So it's kind of like enticing but not giving away too much so that they actually want to go onto your website and yeah, read what you have to offer. So newsletters are just a great way, all in all, <laughs> for um, sharing your, you know, your services and your products on a more consistent level. Another key thing is social media. Um, and as much as, you know, I think the most important thing is to understand which social media platforms are right for your business, your services, your products. You might not have everything. You might not have Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, TikTok. Um, you might not have all of them. You might just have Twitter. You might just have Instagram, or you might have a couple of them. Or you, you could find out that they all are very you know, great for your business. But the one thing I would really um, call out is that to have a consistent social media platform handle. So for us, it's at Edit Her Style, and that's the same on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, because you don't want people to get confused and you want people to easily be able to move from one social media platform to the other and not think, oh, is that the right handle or is that the right handle? So with at Edit Her Style, they can just type that in and they literally will have all of our social media platforms up and running and everything's, um, yeah, everything's really consistent. And then I would say to, when it comes to imagery, you know, for instance, if you're you're selling, you know, art illustrations, um, I would say that it's really good to have some kind of theme going on on your page, because I feel like when I personally, when I go onto Instagram pages and I decide whether to follow a page, I like scroll down the page and see kind of what they're offering. And if it's kind of like all over the place, then I'm like, oh, I don't know what I'm going to expect, which sometimes is nice but it depends how you are, how you're actually showcasing that. And I think when it comes to things like Instagram, people do wanna see that kind of element of um, consistency. They kind of know that they're gonna get a nice, you know, you know, a nice bit of content each day. So for us, we've really 
honed in on the kind of style element of the platform. Um, and I actually, I'll show you the Instagram page so you can actually see. So this is our Instagram page. And as you can see from coming on it, I think you would know just by the images, the kinds of content that you're going to get. So there's a lot of style shots, but it's all kind of, it's not the same kinds of shots each time. So you've got some close ups, you've got some wide shots, you've got some, you know, long distance shots, and then you've got some quotes as well, some like colorful quotes, and it kind of is consistent with our website. So that whole element of being really clean, minimalist, um, really less is more, but then the striking like pops of color, we try to keep that consistent with the website so that it's a brand because it's a brand, whether it's online, offline, whether it's on social media, whether it's on your website. And I think you want people to immediately come onto whatever page they are on that's associated with your brand and know that it's your brand or have some kind of inclination that it is. So I think being really consistent and when you compare this to our website, it is very consistent in terms of that whole strip back, less is more neutral tones, but with the pops of color. So that, that really is important. There are some great brands that are doing this really well, that are showing off their, you know, their art, their creative services, which, you know, traditionally um, you'd think you could only show this off, you know, in physical spaces, but now with the online world, there's so much scope for doing this. And this is one example. So it's called the Slice of Life Project. So millions of points captured to bring point cloud art into your space. So it's it's cloud art and it's really shown off beautifully on this website. So if you look at, for, exam for example, the objects page, and you can see how it kind of, you know, how it's shown online and how it would be shown in a display, on a display, shall I say. So for example, this is an example. And you can see how she's shown this off really beautifully. So this is how she's shown off her art. And it's like really cool photos, really different angles, really different um, in general. And yeah, you can just buy, buy the art really easily, you know, just how you would on a normal shop. But I think it's, it's how the images are really shown off, how they, you hover over them and they change. So you hover over this one, you see how it would look in a physical space. Then you see how it would look just online. Again, you see how it looks, you know, in a physical space and then you see how it would look online. And it's this really, just really clean, again, it's quite similar in our aesthetic, you know, to have this really clean kind of background and then, you know, the actual art, the actual products, the services that you're showing, those are the things that really pop up and really show off, get shown off beautifully. But you don't have to stick to this minimalist um, kind of point of view, but I think it's good to have a balance. So if you're going to be really, you know, over the top, well not over the top, but you know, a bit a bit more colourful, a bit more extreme with your layout, then something to balance it, it would be good to have something that's a bit more toned down. So all in all, I think it's just great to have a great balance. And another example is, which we've covered before um, on edithead.com. So we interviewed, we had someone interview, you know, the CEO of Imperia, which is changing the way we experience luxury online. And it's showing off these really, you know, innovative installations and displaying art, displaying fashion in a really cool way. So I'm actually gonna read you this, this quote. Um, so you think of a Dior store and you think jasmine and rose tea and pink macaroons. You're immersed in this pretty thing that you want to be a part of. People are happy to pay for the experience, not just the product. And that is the core essence of luxury, the experience. And I'm always like, ever since I've, you know, you know, come across this, this platform and ever since it's been showcased on Edit Her, I always love to refer back to that because it's so important. The fact that it's online, you still need to create this kind of experience as if people were in store with you or, you know, meeting you face to face. Um, so, you know how some companies have these chat boxes, which are, you know, good when they are consistent and you can actually get hold of people. It's really good. But there's other ways that you can also show this off. So just by showing off great visuals, by making them feel like they're coming on this journey with you, even though they're not physically with you 
is 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 so key. So um, we definitely recommend honing in on that. There are some quotes that I've pulled out from interviews that we've you we've done with women on Edit Her, which I think are great a great way of you know really communicating what this whole experience of you know monetizing your creative services and your products during the pandemic, during this really hard, uncertain time. So one is it's going to be tough and it's going to be amazing and everything in between, just ride the wave and be resilient. And this actually wasn't a quote to do with the pandemic or anything like that. It was to, just to do with startup life and creating business in general. But I think it's so key to just show resilience because the risks that you take are the ones that are gonna you know, excite you, the ones that are going to maybe take you down an avenue that you didn't know of. So I think risks are good, that they are good. Um, and sometimes we forget it, but there are no limits. Honestly, we can do whatever we want. And I think the beauty of being online is that you literally can, you know, you can contact so many different people. I think really utilize platforms like LinkedIn, utilize all these different platforms, you know, speak to people um, online and, you know, set up interviews with really, amazing creative people, people that inspire you, because the fact that we are online means that we have that ability to contact people from all different parts of the world, um, which might not have been the case if we didn't have these, um, these great online platforms. If we only had physical space, then someone in a completely different region might not be able to contact someone um, from somewhere else, especially during the pandemic if they can travel. So it's really great. And another couple of um, really inspiring quotes, don't be afraid of change. We don't have to go back to how we used to be. So I think that's another key thing and, and balance between newness, comfort and familiarity will be key. So again, these are quotes pulled from edither.com. And I think it's so important to embrace this change. So you've got your platform, so why not try and try and go down that road where you try out a different platform, where you try, you know, just like businesses might have a website, an app, and then their social media platforms. You might have only dabbled in Twitter or only had experience of working with Twitter for your platform, for instance, or, or Instagram, because let's think about it when we're talking about visuals and art and creations, Instagram is a great way to showcase that. And you might have not even considered another kind of platform. But this is the time to experiment and you might figure out that no you're not meant to have this other social media platform but the fact that you've done trial and error is is what's going to keep you up on this pace um so it's really important yeah to just kind of experiment and use this time to really balance between what you've known before what you're just knowing now and what you might know in the future so um so yeah that's that's super important i'd also like to point out that when people are you know, engaging with websites and your services online, one thing that you know, we've shown really as, as, as a society mm -hmm. is that we love this kind of humane feeling, feeling like we are actually connecting with people, like I said before, like connecting with people even if you're not actually there with them. So I feel like getting someone, you know, if you're not someone that's used to, um, that you, you don't know many like writers or you don't know any journalists or anything like that. It would be a really great idea to, you know, get sort of a freelance writer or someone in that kind of domain to maybe do some little Q and A's with people in your, in your industry um, um, that either work for you or people that, you know, are doing great things that are really, that really resonate with what you're doing because interviews bode well with um, people and, for example, this kind of brand that we interviewed. So I done an interview with um, Yvonne Lim, who is, you know, the co-founder of The Array, which is a workwear kind of label. So they do really great chic styles and fashions. And I've had, you know, numerous people tell me that after reading this interview with Yvonne, it's led them to go into the store and just want to buy straight away because you're pulling out really key points that she's saying about her brand and you're really getting to know the woman behind the brand. So you're putting this humane touch, this humane feeling to products in a way. And similar to that quote that we pulled out before that said, you know, it's an experience that you're selling, not just products. This is an experience by interviewing the, the founder, the person who's behind these designs, the co-founder, um, 
makes you really feel what she's creating and makes you really connect with her and really want to buy the products that she's behind. So something like this, I was having so much fun exploring my personal aesthetic. I realized that I didn't put the woman first. How am I empowering women as a designer if I'm making things that they don't want to wear? And this is her showing that she's had this thought process of realizing she wasn't doing what she wanted to do or needed to do in a way. And it makes her seem more human and it makes you want to really buy into her journey in a way. It gives, it gives more of a personal touch to it. Um, so it's like creating this personal shopping experience, not just showing products and that's it and the job's done. It's, it's really investing in the person that you're selling and the person that you're, you know, you're promoting in a sense. Um, and another one, it's soft power dressing, celebrating your femininity, but not having to feel like you need to dress like a man to demonstrate your competence and intelligence. So this is like, you know, a really female empowering, uh, an empowering woman through style in a way. Um, and just by her saying this, this in a snapshot, you know, gives you so much about this brand, tells you so much about their ethos. And if you could get someone to, you know, do some content like this for you, do some writing, some journalistic material, where they even interview you as the founder of your business, or they um, interview, or you interview, you know, get someone to interview someone that resonates with your business, whether it's an artist, an illustrator, someone like that. But the fact that you've got these interviews and you've got these personal interactions, these conversations on your website, creates this human touch, this human interaction that people are more invested in, I think, when they know that there are people behind the services, behind the products, it makes it seem more realistic and more attainable and more relatable <laughs> in a sense. So I would definitely say that's, yeah, super important. And when we go on a website, while we're used to going on the About Us page, that might be the first thing that you do. You'd want to find out about the services that someone's offering or the products that they're um, that they're offering. I'm going to end on this. So I'm going to end on this really key point because the about page is something that people, a lot of people, you know, might gravitate towards straight away. It's really important to tell them about your services in a really concise way that. They, they look on the page and they can immediately see the words that are, you know, resonate with their with their products. So, for instance, you immediately go on the page and you see woman style power, which is our strap line. And it's a different font to say the, the body text, which, again, this creates this, you know, it really makes you focus on the keywords um, and to just create maybe one or two paragraphs not too much um, you can have obviously lots more content because there might be different elements of your your services that you're offering but the really important content the ones that you want people to see straight away that want you know to summarize what you're offering in a snapshot should be right at the beginning of the page and for us we've started edit her we started edit her as a leadership and style online platform for entrepreneur minded women we started straight away with what this website is in a snapshot something that if someone said to you down the road, oh, what's edit her? You could immediately go and say what it is, just like your brands. So it's really important to come up with really snappy content. And that's also meaningful. I think me being meaningful is the most important thing. Um, and again, pulling out these SEO words, leadership, style, online, woman, um, having those kinds of keywords at the beginning of your about me page and to be honest throughout the whole of your website these really strong seo words that don't feel like they've just been forcefully put into your content it's about being really strategic with it and and that's why i would always say you know liaise with people that are really skilled in content strategy um, that really know what they're talking about when it comes to content because content is so important um, and when you know people come onto your website and they see something that's a bit off or see even just mistakes you know something simple as like grammar mistakes or you know that that will play in their mind and that can stay with them and prolong with them so i would say really invest in a great content strategist even if it's just for you know these things can be costly so even if it's just for you know certain areas of your website like the about us page a really vital important page that tells people you know about your brand in a snapshot i would say to do it because it's it's going to really save you a lot of you know, hardship later on. 
And again, you know, I've put, she's all woman, she moves in her own way. She's liberated and free in an italic, bold, kind of, you know, deep red tone. So that again, these things stand out, um, these words, these key words. And yeah, I just think it's so important to, you know, who are we? Question mark. Things like that, that make you feel like you're actually speaking to a person um, rather than just edit her or just um, what you need to know. It, this is more inclusive language, it's more conversational and it creates a good, a good spark with your, with your readership, I would say. So yeah, so those are like the key points that I think it's super important. I think we're at, you know, obviously a, a transitional period with the pandemic and everything that's been going on. And I think it's the perfect time and the perfect opportunity to be experimental and to really explore the different avenues um, that are available to you for monetizing your creative services. And as I said in the beginning, I would start with having, whether you've already got a website and you're trying to adapt it or trying to, you know, grow it or make it different or new because we need to move with the times after all or if you're just starting from you know a really blank canvas or you're really early on in your in your business or your services um i would say to really go onto pinterest or or something like pinterest and create a mood board you might be a person that works better with you know physical with like something on your desk and you're you know sticking things to it or what what have you but i think the most important thing is to create a great, great vision board um, and it might be a few that you have to create for different elements of your services and to get in touch with a great creative team and you don't have to you know you might not have the funds to invest in like the best graphic designer or something like that but people are normally willing to well hopefully they'll be willing to you know if you can create something for them then there might be a service that they can do for you and, and vice versa so i think using platforms like linkedin twitter um, and stuff like that is a great way to you know make sure that you're utilizing your, your the people around you um, but yeah so start with the mood board really invest in the layouts and the graphic design and you know get someone who's really skilled in content to check over your content to make sure that you know even things like grammar and stuff like that, mistakes, spelling mistakes, that's that's not done, but to, to really, yeah, utilize a great creative team. And then to, as I said, experiment with different social media platforms that you might not have considered before, and to find a way to constantly keep that conversation going with, your, with the people that you're targeting. So, um, you know, with us, we did it with a newsletter where we can constantly have a you know weekly updates with people so that they don't forget your brand um, and have really engaging layouts and really engaging content and really you know high quality images high res images um, that said when you're on instagram i think it's great to have a mix of both high quality images and images that are a bit more shall i say hyper real so you know that show show things that could be done on like a phone a smartphone because I, to be honest a lot of the images even say on our Instagram page could be done via a cinema or on a smartphone. But I think it's having that balance between um, really great high quality images and really real images that feel really, you know, realistic and attainable. So, um, so yeah, thank you so much. It's been an absolute pleasure given this um, session. And um, yeah, if you really do want to, you know, speak with me after this, feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn. Um, so it's Sakana Hunter. So S-A-K-A-Y-N-A-H and then Hunter on LinkedIn. Um, and yeah, check out our social media platforms and we're happy to, you know, liaise with you. And again, this is a perfect time to collaborate. So if there's something that you're doing that resonates with our readers and something that we're doing that resonates with, you know, your users or whoever's connecting with your art and your creation and your website and your business and your visuals, then we can always talk about a collaboration as well. So it's been wonderful um, having this session and I wish you all a good day. And yes, uh, hopefully we'll connect at some point again. Thank you, bye. Hi all. So I'm going to be speaking more about ways to you know, monetize your creative services online. 
and so we spoke about some key touch points in the first session and in this session we're going to be speaking about different elements such as how to build confidence in your revenue strategy and whether knowing that it's the right strategy for you and how to really be confident with that and some other touch points as well and then i'm going to towards the end of the session i'm going to talk about some of the challenges that i faced while building edithair.com and also talk to you about some practical elements of you know creative business such as domain names and you know reaching your community um, and stuff like that. So I think we're going to first start by talking about how to really build confidence in knowing that your revenue strategy is the right one for you. And I would say that the most important crucial element of this right from the get go is when it comes to market research. I think market research is the thing that's going to really make you know that your customers that your you know your clients that your people that are engaging with your services they're going to know that you know you're confident in your revenue strategy if you're actually reaching out to them via market research and a platform that i use quite a lot actually is um, survey monkey which is one way of gathering surveys you can create them your own online very easy very simple to use and it is free unless you want to do the advanced plan and maybe ask a few more questions um, so yeah i always use survey monkey and there's lots of other really great um, online platforms for doing that and i would say to do a few surveys so start off by doing one that's a bit more generic um, to kind of gauge where people are at and what they like in terms of how they like engaging with you know certain ways to pay for things or products or services so i think your customers and your target your target clientele are the ones that are going to help you to really know you know what is the best strategy revenue strategy um in that sense um so yeah i would definitely say start off with market research speak to people speak to people via linkedin and ask people that are in your industry that have more experience than you um about this kind of you know area and really gauge what they think would be good as well so i would say that the most fundamental thing is um market research and really getting it out there and mixing it up with you know very open questions but then also more closed questions as well so so you've got a bit of a rough kind of idea and this kind of i would say that this constantly develops i don't think after you when you first do your market research that's just the starting point and it continually you know you continually have to focus on it so while you do, do survey monkey in the beginning you might later on want to dabble with something else with your business and then you'll have to do another survey in that sense and also i would really recommend you know engaging with google analytics so if you set up kind of that account i currently use wordpress for my website so edithair.com is all um yeah it's generated through wordpress wordpress is the is what is powered by and i've got uh, google analytics so i've signed up for that and which means that i can always trace my audience in terms of finding out you know what kind of content is being you know the most read and the most engaged with how long they're spending on each page and also there's that whole element of uh, money as well so it tells you you know how much income you've made from this and that and you know currently edithair.com is not currently taking transactions um but it has that kind of element to it so that for future you know whether you're planning to um yes yeah, sell your services sell your products online you can really understand your customers more and and you know just by google analytics i'm able to find out literally how many minutes or yeah how many minutes are spent on you know each article which articles are performing really well um the kinds of the visitors that are coming onto your site the regular visitors and then also you know new visitors that you get each day so it's really super key to keep the market research going constantly um engaging with you know the analysis side of your business because if you're just doing it blindsided and not knowing um yeah not knowing um what's going on with your audience then you can't really know whether this needs to be done again or you need to maybe do this a different way or um yeah in that kind of sense so definitely i would say if you really work hard to make your market research in depth um and really understand your audience that's the first first start and then i think if you put this down in a really good um a good, a good presented way so that you can always refer back to it and really see if your customers are changing if they're evolving um and so forth and there's obviously different elements to your business so when it comes to doing this market research you might for instance start with the very bare bones of 
you know what you want to get um yeah what you want to find out about your target market so kind of what for example what payment systems do they prefer to use um whether they prefer to use something like paypal whether they prefer to use uh you know the normal way like credit cards and stuff like that because knowing whether you want to include PayPal credit, for instance, or, you know, something like Klarna Pay or something like that is really key. So I think knowing what your customers engage with is, is really important, but then also your customers might not even know what they want to, what they want to engage with in a way, and maybe you could offer them something different. So I think it's a lot of, yeah, using what, you know, your customers want to engage with, and then also testing the waters as well. But I think once you ask these questions and you find out through, as I said, SurveyMonkey is a really good one for creating um, surveys. And then Google Analytics is a great one for keeping and staying ahead of what your, um, yeah, what your users, your readership are, you know, constantly engaging with. I think that's super, super key. Another thing that's super key for really understanding your audience and knowing whether your revenue strategy is the right one for you is by really, really utilizing social media. Um, obviously places like Instagram, you can now do stories where you, people can actually be interactive and for instance, click yes and no to something or choose their preference. So you could even put something like that on social media and say, you know, it might not be this, but it might be, you know, Klarna Pay, PayPal, you know, what do you prefer? And, and you can generate a percentage and find out what it is that people prefer, what your target market prefers. Um, Twitter, use it on Twitter, on LinkedIn. Um, even if you get someone to create kind of, you know, an article where you can also create like a message board or, you know, a place for comments where people can talk about what they prefer to engage with. Something like that is super key. I would also say that the beauty of things being a lot online now, currently like a lot of things being online, is that you can now attend all of these social, you know, these networking events or these, these industry insight events. For instance, in, you know, my industry, there's this program called Women at Dior and it's, you know, it's for, you know, women leadership and which relates very much with what we're doing at Edit Her. So I attended the LinkedIn online kind of seminar session that they did. And from that, you can message people while the meeting's going ahead and you can meet people that way. So you can always engage. I also went to a Harper's Bazaar event. Um, again, another really empowering female leadership event. And from that, I managed to create some good contacts. And one of the uh, women that I interviewed for edithead.com, she happened to be the one that was hosting the event. So I met her that way and people, you know, I put my handles um, in the message board for that event. And I said, you know, edithead.com, you know, it's a woman's leadership and start online platform. And then I had a few people come back to me and say, I would love to hear more. And they sent me their email address. So really make the most of the fact that there's these online events and LinkedIn is a really great way to just, if you just search, you know, all these different summits coming up or these seminars or networking events and use that as a chance to network and use the comment box and the message sections, whether it's on Zoom or Meets or, um, LinkedIn, just use that chance, use your opportunities wisely because you can meet some great people um, that way. And I think it's about going the extra mile, um, not just waiting for it to happen, but to really create that contact, create and be persistent um, in a sense. So, you know, just make sure that if you meet someone that's super inspiring that you think can either, you know, it might be that they're giving you advice or it might be that they're a great person to collaborate with or it might be that they're the person that's going to be your customer. But I think definitely um, utilizing message, message boards when it comes to, you know, online conferences and online seminars is such a great way to um, uh, gain contacts. And it's definitely a way that I've gained a lot of contacts myself. Being um, in the journalism industry and being the journalist that I am. I am very pro some of these subscriptions that they have. So, you know, if they have like news websites or uh, magazines and they have, you know, a subscription that you can do so you can get all the extra bonuses of being a subscriber. And I subscribe to uh, one of the ones that I subscribe to is Business of Fashion um, because it relates to my industry. And from that, you get so many really engaging, really inspiring and really educational videos um, on your industry. And from that, you can also, the, the speakers, the keynote speakers, you know, in those sessions, you can then 
Google them, search them on LinkedIn, connect with them, introduce yourselves. I really do think that sometimes it's worth putting that little bit of, you know, money or you know investing in those subscriptions and i don't think obviously it's not every single one's going to be for you and i think you have to be wise because you don't want to be spending too much and not getting much from it but i think if you do some research and find out the publications um the websites that are perfect for you and what you want and what you think your customers um, would engage with as well then you can really attend some great video sessions um, you can watch them you can play them back and you can not only just note down the key speakers from that event who could end up being your customers your clients people that you collaborate with but you also learn you know new different tools and you can also move with the times because if it's for instance a news website or something that's very news heavy it means that they're always engaging with current events and that means that you're able to keep um, up to date with what's going on and be able to adapt um, and engage your readers um, based on you know what's going on currently so I think 100% so utilize social media use utilize networking events online and you know physically in where you are as well when that's when that opportunity presents itself and definitely um, subscriptions as well so I think those those three key things are, are su super key One of the things I wanted to touch on was the whole subject of, you know, things like domain names and getting the domain name that you want. I currently use and I have used for a very long time GoDaddy. Um, so I used it for like my personal accounts um, when I was starting out in the industry. And then I've used it for edithere.com as well. And it's a very, very easy to use. And you can, you know, search obviously your the domain name that you want hoping that it's available if it's not available there's usually some other options as well but one thing i would say is to do that very early in the game um, and if you already have your you know your idea of what you want i think it's a really good thing to have the kind of the name that you want to go for but then also have other options just in case and you're normally presented with options such as .com, .co.uk, .org. Um, i ended up purchasing .com, .co.uk like because i wanted more than one um, based on the fact that I wouldn't want someone else with the same brand name as me and the only difference was they had .com and I had .co.uk or vice versa. So I think um, if you're willing to invest in that then to um, buy more than just one, buy you know, .com and .co.uk. But yeah, GoDaddy is a really great one. And if your domain name is taken, I would advise that you, um, as I said, you have other options because I don't think it's wise to have a name that's too similar to someone else because there's there can be a clash um, and if it's a case that you feel very strongly about that name um, which you know has been the case you know for all of us I'm sure then go for it by all means but then make sure that you then think about trademarking and stuff like that because as long as you've got the if your name is similar to someone else's a little bit similar or it reminds you of theirs in any way you know if you really build your business and you really create a really viable um business and brand and then you trademark it then it's it's, it's great you know um but yeah so definitely um go for GoDaddy, and then you can either your website provider your the person that you know kind of monitors your website can either be done you know via that kind of way GoDaddy, or you can get someone else to do it for me personally um my graphic designer and web developer they team together and they are the ones that you know they're my hosts um but yes it's done through godaddy so that's a really a really great easy way and you know i i recommend it because i've used it for a while and it's i've not had um many issues um yet so yeah and in terms of pricing i paid around um 50 something pounds and then I had to renew it again. So um, yeah, you just say like 50 something pounds, maybe annually um, and then, yeah, and so forth. And I know that they have an option where if your name say is taken and someone else has got it. So if someone else has got the domain name that you want, I think you can do something like you can bid for it or you can you know, negotiate a, an offer or price, which might get a bit sticky and might get a bit messy and might be expensive. So um, that's why I always say to have some other options um as well and and then yeah so i would say when it comes to reaching your community online you really do need to be like a, a multi-platform person should i say because it's really great to have an audience on 
you know, different platforms. But like I said in my previous uh, session, you know, you don't want to have everything if it's not relevant to what you're doing. But say if you have Twitter and Instagram and LinkedIn, for instance, then you want to just constantly, you know, make sure it's quality, not just you're not just putting out comments or putting out content, obviously, that's not not going to really do much. But I think it's really important to be very, very engaging and be interactive on, on platforms, especially like LinkedIn, because it's it's for professionals. It's you're going to find loads of different creative people that, you know, you want to liaise with. So personally, for me, when I'm on LinkedIn, I do post quite regularly. And um, so I post articles, um, I comment on things that are relevant to me. And just by a simple comment on LinkedIn, someone can then you know, see your name, see what you do, and then they might click onto you. And then from that, that's a new relationship discovered. They might try connect with you and then they might look at your platforms and then it just keeps developing. It's just a cycle, cycle, cycle. So I think definitely comment, like, um, post things, engage in things, be interactive and just, yeah, just keep the conversation going with all different platforms that you have, because that's the way that you're going to keep you're going to have sustainable or an, a sustainable audience because there's one thing having an audience but um yeah if it's not sustainable then it's not you know it's not going to be something that you can vouch for continuously so um so that's what i would definitely say another thing that i would say when it comes to reaching your community and your audience is to make the use of really great apps for me, I use this app called All Bright, which is a whole community of like-minded women. And from the app, you can really connect with women um, that are, you know, female leadership, you know, pioneers um, and stuff like that. Because while you have really, um, you know, big sites such as LinkedIn that have people from all kinds of industries, you can really connect with people that are have more of a niche audience. And then you can really, you know, meet people that are perfectly aligned with what you're doing. So places like Albright and that app, I can connect with people, I can go on training courses, you know, see training courses and engage with really great editorial content that's perfectly aligned with what I'm doing. Um, so using these kinds of niche apps and these apps that are really, you know, resonate with you personally and what you're building is a really great way to start talking to people, start meeting new people, um, getting new followers, you know, and getting people to subscribe to your to your um, channel. And I got my subscribers by constantly engaging in conversations, by posting things on LinkedIn, by setting up Zoom calls, having coffee meetings with people that I hadn't met yet, but I was, I was keen and adamant that I really wanted to meet them because I thought they were super inspiring. And then and that I could, you know, visit them and visit what their, you know, their showrooms or, you know, mm -hmm. their fashion brand or, or so. And we've spoken about that, that when things do return to a bit more of a normal situation, that we can, um, yeah, we can engage in that way. So I think it's really important to do that. And you might not even know what the topic of the conversation might be um, in some sense. But if you say you want to meet up for a coffee date with someone um, via Zoom, you know, a coffee work date sort of thing, then you can really, the conversation can go anywhere and you might not even realize what comes from it. So um, yeah, so I done it by speaking on social media, speaking on LinkedIn, commenting on people, um, platforms that, you know, really liaise with me. And if they were, if they were asking for something that I knew that I could offer them, then I would definitely mention edithher.com um, when it was necessary, because I think it's a great way to get people um, in your conversation and building your kind of community. So yeah. So it was really great having this session with you. Thank you so much for um, having me and um, yeah, it's super, super exciting event. And I hope that you could take a lot of way from, you know, the ways to monetize your creative services. And like I said previously in my other session, please feel free to connect with me and to ask me questions and to um, check out edithair.com, subscribe if it's, if it takes your liking, you know, if it's, it's, if it's to your liking and you fancy reading about women's leadership and style, please do. But yeah, happy to connect and thank you again and enjoy the rest of your um, session today. Thank you, take care, bye. Thank you, Miss Sakina Hunter. Miss Hunter will not be able to join us today, unfortunately. So here to answer questions on her behalf, 
is an arts and culture practitioner who is dedicated to offering support to the arts, creative industries, and social enterprise portfolios. With his 11-year professional experience and expertise in project and event management, he has managed to create avenues for art education, artist recognition, and skills development. He has the newest program of the British Council Philippines, the Creative Communities Learning Lab, which is a new series of dynamic and accessible online learning modules for creative and cultural professionals around the world. Designed with input from creative hub leaders from Southeast Asia and the UK, such as Ms. Hunter. Please welcome Program Officer for the British Council in the Philippines, Mr. Henry Palma. Hi, everyone. Uh, good morning. Hi, uh, hi. Good morning, Henry. Hi, Martin. Through Martin. No, just call me Martin. Yeah. <laughs> Unfortunately, we don't have that much time for questions, but there is one out there and I'm hoping you'll be able to answer it. And it's, uh, how can we best apply Miss Hunter's tips for online marketing to the performing arts field? Right, um, I think, um, are, are you referring to the performing arts in the academe or in general? Uh, preferably in the academe since most of our audience um, is from the academe. Right. I think for every academe or academic institutions, we have um, web pages or websites dedicated to our programs and activities and uh, also social media pages promoting our activities. Um, I think uh, we need to utilize these channels uh, and platforms for us to reach our stakeholders. Um, depends, though, for example, if coming from a school, of course, definitely um, our, our, our target market or our reach should be the students. and. Uh, Given the tips and insights provided by Sakena, uh, we can, I think, uh, start on uh, improving um, the layouts and designs of our websites and at the same time, um, how we can uh, maximize the social media channels since, you know, everything's online now. Um, it's really hard to um, get people's attention since there are a lot of contents available online and I think we really need to invest in uh, good graphics and visuals and aesthetics because it's one way it's one way of you know getting the attention of the people uh, that we would like to reach yeah that actually is another topic that we will need to devote more time to and hopefully we will be able to collaborate with the british council on uh, such a future learning session yes uh, there are some comments and questions on the chat can I just direct uh, you, Henry, to sure. those comments and chats and maybe answer them? And that goes to our audience too. If you do have other comments and questions about using websites and other platforms and on this topic in general and on the topics that uh, Ms. Hunter mentioned, uh, please um, go to the chat for now. All right. And okay. then. Hopefully, we will have other opportunities to uh, discuss this. Other opportunities and other platforms. Yes. Um, actually, before I answer some of the questions, um, I'd like to uh, share the relationship, or I mean, why I'm speaking on behalf of uh, Sakena. Um, so Sakena is one of the co-authors of uh, the courses uh, from our Creative Communities Learning Lab, which is also about ways to monetize your creative services. So um, yeah, that's, that's, that's a context of why I'm, why I'm here. Um, to answer a Randy, I think Randy has been participating in our events, the British Council, so hi Randy. Um, to answer your question, what would be your suggestions on startups or creative hubs in these trying times? Um, I think first is you, you need to assess um, your available resources, may it be financially, um, also human resources and skills available. Um, from there, you can um, identify and um, you know which among your existing programs you'd like to launch um, and maybe maintain because you know there are some creative hubs that were established prior to the pandemic and now they're thriving um, given the different um, learnings and um, creative adaptations that they've learned from their own experiences and from the other experiences of creative hub leaders, not just here in the Philippines, but also globally. So in relation to that, um, I'd like to share with you the uh, Creative Communities Learning Lab. Um, it is uh, one of our, it's our free um, 
self-led courses for creatives and by creatives. And here um, you can learn how to um, you know, offer your um, products and services online and how to generate revenue during these trying times and also how you can build your communities successfully online. So um, the content of these courses um, were uh, or came from uh, our lessons or learnings from the insights that um, hub leaders we've uh, tapped, not just uh, in the Philippines, but also uh, in Southeast Asia and the UK. So um, the topics include uh, digital community strategy and management, bring your training online, and uh, just what Sakena discussed today, um, ways to monetize your creative services. OK, great. And thanks for also sharing it on the chat. And so if you in the audience want to know more about the programs of the British Council in the Philippines, please um, check out the, the link that's on the chat and check out their other uh, platforms and their website as well. Thank you, Henry. And thank you for introducing us also or helping us connect with uh, Ms. Hunter. Thank you. Before we wrap up this segment, we would like to present you and Ms. Hunter with these certificates of appreciation. Once again, may I request our AUNCA chair, Ms. Glorife Samuadio, to turn on her camera for the awarding of certificates to our speakers. I will read the certificates. The ASEAN University Network, ASEAN University Network, on Culture and the Arts, Commission on Higher Education, and the Association of Cultural Offices in Philippine Educational Institutions Incorporated present the Certificate of Appreciation to Ms. Sakina Hunter and Mr. Henry Palma for generously sharing their insights as parallel speakers on the topic on monetizing creative services and products under the theme Managing the Arts and Empowering Young Artists in the New Normal, Part 2. For the AUNCA Crosslight Online Learning Sessions Day 3, given virtually this 18th day of June, 2021. Signed by Ms. Glorife Samorio, AUNCA Chair, and Dr. Shaltis Diratiti, AUN Executive Director. Thank you. Thank you very much, Henry and Sakina. Thank you. Um, I relay your um, messages to Sakina. It's 3 or it's 4 a.m. now in the UK. So yeah. uh, we're really thankful for this opportunity yes. to talk about um, uh, ways to monetize your creative services. Yes. And thank you, sir, uh, to Martin also for hosting uh, this session. Before you leave, Henry, we would like to ask a photo with you and our participants. So can we ask our participants to turn on their cameras for this quick photo op? Great. Thank you, everyone. Again, thank you, Henry. Thank you to the British Council. Thank you. And please stay on. Stay on for our final talk this morning, which is something that is of interest to all of us and has been constantly on the chat boxes these last uh, two, three weeks of these learning sessions. But before that, we will ask all of you to turn off their cameras for our next segment, after which we will proceed directly with our third and last speaker. In our first session last June 4, we met some of the faculty members of Guangxi University. Now it's time to virtually meet their student artists. Today's guest performance tells the story of a blind man who isolates from the outside world after the death of his wife, with his sole source of solace being his tianqin, a traditional musical instrument. All that changes when he meets a young lady who becomes enamored with his Tianxin and starts to communicate with the old man in a playful way. As a result, the old man rediscovers his soul as more young individuals discover his music. 
This is a story of preserving treasured traditions and passing them on to younger generations. We present to you the story of Tianjin by the dance major students of Guangxi University in China. Mm-hmm. 
That was indeed spellbinding and spectacular. Thank you to the dance majors of Guangxi University. Xie Xie. Welcome back to week three of Crosslight Online Learning Sessions. Our final speaker spent 30 years teaching in De La Salle University's Commercial Law Department, Philosophy Department, and College of Law. He has also served as the school's university legal over the past 13 years. Currently, he is the director of the DLSU Intellectual Property Office and has been manager of the DLSU Innovation and Technology Support Office over the past decade. During the open forums of our first two sessions, a lot of questions were asked regarding his topic. We hope to answer them later. Here to tell us more about intellectual property rights, please welcome Attorney Christopher Cruz. Good morning to everyone. The topic that I want to share with you this morning is about intellectual property rights for creative works. I know that you have many questions about the interplay of IP you know, in creative arts, literary works, and the performing arts. And I'll try to uh, give you a summary you know, of the different rules that relate to IP rights and then later we can have a session on the question and answer so that we can uh, discuss more specifically you know, your, your concerns. Uh, thank you for the organizers for this invitation, you know, for the AUN Culture and the Arts Crosslight Learning Series. And uh, being part of the ASEAN, we have you know, this uh, system of protecting IP rights you know, in the region. So if you look at uh, ASEAN intellectual property, the ASEAN economic community has uh, established you know, that the, the, the key role of IP in national and regional economic goals. And so uh, the AEC has play, already have a blueprint you know, uh, called AEC 2025, which encourages the ASEAN member states to establish policy environment supportive of innovation and intellectual property. And uh, it started no, way back in 1995 via the ASEAN Framework Agreement on International Cooperation and the Technical Working Group. And I'm happy to uh, note no, that uh, this year, in March 2021, the Philippines uh, became the chair no, of the ASEAN Working Group on IP Cooperation to implement no, the IPR Action Plan 2016 to 2025. So you see, uh, intellectual property plays a big role no, in uh, the ASEAN region. And I'd like to say, you know, that uh, more or less the laws of the ASEAN member states, you no, know, are similar because of this cooperation, and of course also because of our agreement accession to the TRIPS agreement. So the AUNIP, which is uh, similar to your AUN Culture and the Arts, is another um, unit or division no, of AUN which concentrates on intellectual property. No? It was uh, established uh, to enhance IP knowledge in the region in the fields of IP education, IP research, and IP curriculum. And I think that the one of the main goals of the AUN IP is to foster IP protection, innovation, and technology transfer. No? And I'm fortunate to be part of some of the meetings of AUN IP. I hope to uh, take part again no, in any future meetings of AUN. So 
Today, my topic is about intellectual property. And some of you might ask, what is intellectual property? No? Uh, some might look at it as uh, an obscure term, that it is only for law or lawyers. But that is farther from the truth, no? because uh, intellectual property is for everyone. No? It is pervasive. It can be a tremendous economic tool. No? And uh, as you have seen no, in the turn of the century, IP has become a valuable asset no, in commercial transactions. Just look at the top 500 companies no, in the world. All of them are IP intensive companies. And so from tangible assets of the 20th 20th century, they're now being replaced by intangible assets no? like intellectual property in the 21st century. So from the manufacturing age, we are now in the knowledge economy. So I'd like to share to you this next slide, which is about WIPO. No? WIPO or the World Intellectual Property Organization is the is a United Nations backed uh, organization that uh, supervises no treaties involving intellectual property and it has a lot of programs to increase awareness on intellectual property so if you want to know more about IP then you can go to this website so as i was saying from the agrarian uh, economy of the 20, 20, early 20th century to the industrial economy of the mid 20th century, we are now in the technological age of the 21st century. So there is now a shift you know, from real property to intellectual property. Now, our topic is about uh, copyright and uh, IP rights on creative works. Let me uh, show you some cases involving these issues. And uh, probably later during the question and answer, we can uh, discuss them even more. So some of you may already know the monkey selfie case. So uh, this is the picture of Naruto who made a selfie you know, of himself. Um, in 2011, David Slater went to Indonesia to film or to take pictures of uh, monkeys, no? like uh, the one in your picture. So he set up the lighting, he set up the aperture of the camera and everything uh, he was not satisfied and then suddenly uh, Naruto took a selfie no, of himself so the question now is who owns the intellectual property of the selfie uh, taken by Naruto himself can a monkey own copyright second case is the case of Lindsay versus RMS Titanic. Uh, in this case, uh, Lindsay was a independent documentary filmmaker and he wanted to uh, make a documentary of the expedition no? uh, to see the remains, no? what remains of the Titanic. And so, while uh, she was on board a vessel, she prepared the cameras, asked uh, people to dive and took uh, to take pictures no, of, of the Titanic. Question now is, does Lindsay own copyright over the pictures, even if she was not the one who actually took the picture, but she arranged no, uh, the lighting, the facility in, in order to make 
these good pictures he was the one she was the one who instructed no the one who took pictures on how to take no uh, good pictures of the titanic so that's another question no? here is another case involving uh, a video game called fortnite um in fortnite if you if you will play the game uh, you will have a character and you can buy emotes no emotes are features of a character where you can dance and uh, so do do certain things uh, to mock an opponent no now in this case uh, fortnite it was alleged no uh, copied the dance steps no of dance choreographers and if you will compare them they are very similar if not the same so question now is uh, do these uh, dance choreographers have a right no uh, over the dance steps that were used in this game and another case involving uh, the french media google uh would take excerpts from these news channels and put them in their google search engine so the french french media uh are asking the company to pay them for the video you no know, and for the material yeah. so can the french media do, uh, do that Another case involving the telephone directory, uh, in the case of Feist Publications versus Rural Telephone, um, someone collected the names and addresses of people you know, in a community and put them into a telephone book. Question now is, is that copyright protected? Do we need creativity in order for there to be copyright protection another um, current issue on intellectual property is artificial intelligence no? and that's being discussed now in the world intellectual property organization what if ai creates ip who owns the intellectual property so these are just some of the many issues that we currently have and there are there are, some have answers some are still being debated upon and so later during the question and answer we can share our thoughts you know, about the matter so let me just give you an overview of what copyright is you know, and the concepts of the limitations on copyright fair use uh, just to put us up to speed on what the subject matter is and so later we can uh, uh, answer no, your 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 uh, questions about the topic so copyright is the legal protection extended to the owner of a work no, that is original so when we say original uh, it is not equivalent to novelty in patent no but it is simply a work that came from the author so for as long as the author did not copy the work then that is already original no? um, what are the conditions for protection uh, since copyright is a statutory right it would depend on the law of specific jurisdictions but generally uh, the conditions are originality and that it must be expressed in some form no uh, what about creativity in the telephone directory case uh, that i mentioned a while ago the court in the united states said no that there is no creativity in just compiling names and telephone numbers of people and therefore that is not protected by copyright no so under the sweat of the brow test no, or uh, the labor test there must be some effort in order for there to be 
protection. Now, if you look at Philippine law, uh, it simply says all expressions of ideas no, are protected by copyright regardless of the form, content, or mode of expression. So it may seem no, that uh, in that case, uh, for as long as there is minimum level of effort, no, then that is protected by copyright. Basic concept also in copyright is the non-formality rule, meaning you don't need to register your work in order to be protected by uh, copyright, unlike patents or trademarks. And as I've mentioned, copyright is a statutory right, and therefore um, what is protected depends no, on the law of each state. The idea expression dichotomy, uh, dichotomy uh, means that mere ideas are not protected, but the expressions of the ideas you know, are the ones protected by copyright. So, for example, if you have an idea of, let's say, a boy riding a bike uh, along the seashore, that's the idea, you can express it in several ways. You, know? you can write a poem. You can paint that idea. You can make a sculpture. Um, so it, you, you can express it in several modes. And they are separately protected by copyright because the idea itself is not protected. So what are protected by copyright? No? What works are protected? No? So I'm basing this from Philippine law, although I would... Uh, say that this is true also in other uh, laws in the ASEAN region no? because we have uh, acceded to the TRIPS no? uh, agreement and we have, uh, as I mentioned a while ago, the ASEAN economic community no? where we try to harmonize our policies and regulations. So there are two types of works that are protected. There are other original works as enumerated here, like books, uh, dramatic, musical, compositions, drawings, paintings, photos, audiovisual, computer programs. And the second one is called the derivative work, where it is an adaptation, translation, or compilation of the original work. No? So these two have separate forms of copyright. One Original, meaning it, it was not derived from any other work, while a derivative work is, is a transformation, translation, adaptation, or even a compilation of previous works. Now, you might ask a question, who owns the copyright? No? Um, as a default in literary and artistic works, it is the author or the creator. Joint ownership, then co-authors. Uh, if you can separate the parts, then the one contributed by that particular author will be uh, attributed to that author. No? Uh, in the IP Code of the Philippines, it is mentioned that in an employer-employee relationship, uh, if the work is part of the regular duties, then it's owned by the employee but if it is part of the regular duties then it is owned by the employer for audiovisual works then each part shall be owned by the one who contributed to it no? and uh, for letters copyright belongs to the author to the writer uh, and that the one who receives the letter only owns the physical copy no, of the letter, but not the contents because the contents uh, are protected by copyright. Now, for each institution, ownership can also be determined by the IP policies. So, if the law does not give the specific rules on ownership, then the IP policies of each company or institution will be uh, the, the determining factor. So it's very important to have IP policies for the institution. 
There are two types of rights in copyright, no? We have the economic rights, no? Uh, which include the right to reproduce, transform, rent, display, communicate, and the moral rights or the right to maintain uh, your personal connection with the work, no? Like the right of attribution, like to make alteration, and even the right not to be named no? or to be the right to be anonymous. So these are the two uh, separate rights of uh, copyright. And uh, there is another form of IP protection which is not strictly speaking copyright but called related rights of copyright. No? Uh, so these are the rights of performers. Performers like actors, dancers, interpreters. Um, while, let's say, the song has a separate copyright, the singer has a performance right, no, or a related right of copyright separate from the song. So, um, that is the reason why there is a prohibition to record or videotape live performances. Because the performers have a copyright over their rendition no, of the song or of the dance no, or of the work of art. So that is uh, an, an example of the related rights of copyright. And under the law, uh, it can be managed through CMOs or copyright management organizations. So we know now what is copyright. What are now the limitations on copyright? Meaning, under these circumstances, there is no copyright infringement. So let us just look at them. Uh, this is a uh, cat categorization of the limitations. Uh, so num number one is public domain. No? So if it is already part of public domain, then it is no longer protected by copyright. So what are they? No? So uh, what are these instances? So if the copyright has already expired, in the Philippines, it's 50 years after the death. In other countries, it's 70 years after the death of the author. So once that time comes, then it is now available for reproduction, for use by everyone. Public domain may also include subject matter. No? So when the subject matter itself is not protected, like mere ideas, procedures, methods, or operations, uh, mere discovery or mere data as such, news of the day, then they are not protected by copyright. So you see, not everything is protected by copyright. No? Uh, so if it's part of public domain, then everyone can have access to it. Okay. Another uh, exception to copyright are what we call statutory limitations. Now, so these statutory limitations are provided by law. So in the Philippines, they are found in Section 184 of our IP code. No? In other countries, it may be in their own IP code. But if you look at the enumeration here of the statutory limitations, uh, what you see in common is that if the work is used for private, non-commercial purposes and they're free of charge or they are part of mass media or news of the day, then they are limitations on copyright. No? For uh, time constraints, no? we'll not be able to discuss them one by one, but that is the spirit no, behind the limitation. Now, the third limitation, which I know is uh, very 
popular no is the concept of fair use or fair dealing no so under this concept if the work is used for criticism comment news reporting and uh, including reproduction for limited copies for classroom use then there is no copyright infringement and uh, the fair use doctrine no is uh, has four factors no so we have here the four factor test in determining whether an uh, work is considered fair use so first is the purpose and character of use second is the nature of the copyrighted work third is the amount no uh, of, or substantiality of the work and number four is the effect upon the potential market of the work so this four factor test no uh, shall be applied on a case to case basis no uh, and uh, ultimately it is the courts and and uh, who will determine whether an act or a use is considered fair use no so here uh, you will see another illustration of the application of fair use so if it is transformative non 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 profit it is already published it's factual the portion used was not essential or small and it won't prevent the ip owner no from benefiting financially no or economically over the work then that is considered as fair use so here are examples of uh, fair use no one is the compilation no and so this is a reproduction of a code or translation of a code for interoperability no so so that uh, if there are two systems no uh, in uh, software uh, in order for you for for them to communicate or talk or so that they can operate then and you use no the codes no in order to do that then that is fair use no under uh philippine law no under republic act 10372 parody no uh parody exists when uh, one imitates a serious piece of work for a humorous or satirical effect no so in these cases of campbell versus Aqua Froze uh, involving the song Pretty Woman and uh, Vanilla Ice uh, and the song Ice Ice Baby and uh, the Queen Under Pressure uh, there was parody no that was the defense no for copyright infringement so in the case of Campbell versus Aquel Rose the court ruled there that there is no infringement because um there is a distinct feature no uh in the parody and that in order for you to make a parody you need to copy some some portions no of the original work in the case of vanilla ice versus queen uh, we would not know the ruling here because they settled no but that shows you, you know that uh, a remake of a song may be considered as copyright infringement. So we have to look at these things carefully. What about mashup? No, mashup is a digitally created song that splices the elements of other songs no, and make it one song. So getting bits of pieces of other songs, putting it in one song. That's a mashup. And that is considered no, as infringement. It is not fair use. What about a painting and then you make a sculpture, like in the case of Rogers versus Coons? Uh, let me show you that picture here. So in this case of Rogers versus Coons, do you think that there is 
infringement here or, or is this fair use? What about in the bottom picture in the case of Karu versus Prince where the original is on the left side and uh, the copy is on the right side? So in the case of Rogers versus Coons, the court held that there was a, they, are, they were substantially similar no? and therefore this is not fair use. But in the case of Karu versus Prince, um, the court ruled differently and said that this is an expression no? uh, of the author on the right side and therefore there is no copyright infringement. On appeal, it was settled, no? so there is no, there was no final judgment from a higher court on this. No? But the lesson to be learned here is that each case no, shall be determined based on the unique circumstances. And uh, we, we, we really cannot make a hard and fast rule regarding fair use. So what constitutes infringement? No? In this Philippine case of Habana versus Robles, the test is if so much is taken that the value of the original is diminished or the labors of the author are substantially appropriated by another, there is infringement. So it is not in the amount or quantity, but it is in the content. So that is the test. For determining whether there is infringement in this case it involves uh, the infringement of an English grammar textbook and the court found in this case that there was infringement because uh, much of the original was copied no? and that the labors of the author were substantially appropriated so in the intellectual property rights for creative works, you will see here that uh, IP exists no? in literary works, in visual arts, in the music industry, in the film industry, in the gaming industry, just like in the Fortnite case, works of arch architecture, sculptures, books. So there are many uh, works no, that are protected by copyright and so there is a uh, real need no, to be informed no, about the rules on copyright so that number one we can protect our own creative works and number two so that we will also know how to respect and not infringe on the works of others in one forum attended by artists, no, uh, composers, uh, these are some of the concerns no, that uh, they have on copyright. Like, for example, using copyrighted songs in campaign jingles or in advertisements. No? So they use the melody, no? then they just change the words for campaigns in elections, for example. So this is one concern no? uh, raised in that forum. Uh, or some would replay the performances of copyrighted works in TV or the internet when the contract was only for one showing. No? So that's another concern. And of course, the concern about online use and streaming of copyrighted works. No? Uh, uh, the fact that it is available in the internet doesn't mean that they are free or that they are not protected by copyright. So even those with Creative Commons licenses, no? uh, Creative Commons licenses um, would require persons who will use them to act according to the terms and conditions of the license. So, in other words, uh, in a CC license, number one, it still acknowledges IP ownership. 
and that number two, it can be used only under the specific terms of the Creative Commons license. So still, there is a license to speak of. So we should uh, take note of that wrong notion that if it is in the internet, then it is already free to use. And another issue is about providing proper value to the work of artists. No? Um, uh, an artistic work, of course, is subjective. It may be valuable to some, but not to others. So, uh, one suggestion is to have a way in order to properly value works so that artists can uh, benefit no? uh, from their works. So, in using uh, copyright, these are some of my notes or tips. Uh, if possible, use works in the public domain no? so that you're sure that there is no copyright infringement. And what is in the, in the public domain? I mentioned if copyright has already expired or uh, the subject matter is not protected by copyright. You can also look at the limitations of copyright in your uh, laws, no? in your country. Number two, use licensed works works that give you permission no? to use them for your own purposes. So, be mindful of the terms and conditions, for example, of a Creative Commons license. Third would be uploading only works that you made or you're authorized to use. And in case you're not sure, then you ask. No? Uh, when in doubt, you ask permission. And although we have a various doctrine no, under our system of laws in the Philippines is under Section 185. Try to use it conservatively, meaning uh, as much as possible you comply with most of the factors in the four-factor test so that you are assured no, that it is a proper application of fair use. So, in conclusion, let me end with two quotes. The first one is this, all artists are protected by copyright and we should be the first to respect copyright. So, um, it is a balancing no, of rights. If the artists want their works to be respected and protected, then the artists themselves should be the model no, and be the first one to respect copyright of others. And with this quote also, I'd like to end this talk. The, the copyright bargain, uh, balancing uh, the rights of protecting the artist and the rights for the consumer. So with that, thank you for your time. I'm happy to be here, and uh, we're now open for questions. Thank you. Thank you so much for all that information, Attorney Christopher Cruz. Apart from knowing how to market and monetize our work, we feel fortunate that we now know our legal rights as artists and how to also be conscious in using intellectual property of our colleagues in the industry. May we ask Attorney Cruz to turn on his camera for the open forum? Yes, good morning. And I'm Hi, uh, good morning. Good morning. Thank you for being with us. Thank you for sharing so much knowledge. It's a topic that has been on our minds uh, these last uh, three weeks of the conference, but especially during the pandemic. And I'd like to delve straight into the question of how can we create digital content and still make sure that we are following um, the proper laws, whether it's for a dance performance, the music that we use, how long can we keep a performance online? And who do we need to talk to to get these licenses? Yeah, so uh, copyright is 
especially as applied no to literary and artistic works no like in uh, musical compositions or in performances no they are quite complex no that's why uh, we have a lot of questions about this especially in applying uh, principles no and and law in in copyright more especially fair use no um you know this is a an area where sometimes the court says that it is fair use sometimes it is not so my piece of advice here is that let's just uh take note of the four factor test and then try to apply it in individual cases and see if uh it would be fair no um under the circumstances so i think that these concepts are best understood if there are specific questions or specific applications so if, if there are questions that would uh, that would ha that would apply these principles we would be happy to i would be happy to share my thoughts on that i guess there's like a question now that our productions are online um do we have to set a time limit as to how long the performance will be up and then is it also for just a philippine market or as an asean market yeah. or is it for a global market and i'm sure there's different pricing for that or different categories mm -hmm. and rules maybe mm -hmm. okay so copyright uh, as i mentioned in the in the talk is is a statutory right meaning each country may have its own uh, law on copyright although there is that basic uh, principle as in in the burn convention so for example in the Philippines, you don't have to register copyright, no. Uh, although some do that, but in the U.S., in order for you to enforce your copyright, you need to register. So, not that not that copyright is created because of registration, but only in the enforcement. That's why in that Fortnite dance case, no, I, I mentioned a while ago, uh, that case was delayed because the copyright over the dance steps were not registered in the U.S. So they have to withdraw the case register it first, and then uh, up, wait for a few months in order to file the case again. So, um, as to the length in the digital platform, if you own it, no, if you are the owner, meaning you, you did not get a license from anyone, then you can put it there as long as you want, no, because you are the owner of the, of the copyright. Now, if there is a license and you're only allowed, let's say, to use this song for one performance then as uh, mentioned in one of the concerns no in in, in uh, one uh, forum if you replay that showing then that is a violation already of the contract uh, violation of the license which of course no uh, you will not be allowed to do that so um it depends on the contract it depends on the license and so if it's safe, if you own the copyright or you are assigned that copyright, then you have more liberty no, on, on using it. Okay, that's very helpful. Now, if we can get permission, let's say, from the owner of the work to post it online for an unlimited duration, Mm -hmm. that is okay already that permission is all that we need yes uh in fact uh, for musical compositions for example now we have a collective uh, management association now we have philscap now philscap is the a non-government organization that is the licensee of most of our composers now most of our musical works and so uh, their role is to facilitate the license so that you don't have to talk to the composers one by one. So you talk to them, they talk to the composers and the uh, artists, and they will be your conduit to the license. And that license now, again, will the, the terms of the license will depend on your uh, negotiation with the with, with Phil Calls, you know, which... In turn, no, they will ask permission from the artists themselves. And if we cannot access the 
owners directly, what channels do we take or use? Yes. Um, for example, in literary works, we call them orphan works. No, Orphan works are works that are protected by copyright, but you don't know or you cannot contact the owner. So if it is an orphan work, that does not mean that you can use it already. No, uh, In the UK, for example, there is an orphan work law where uh, part of the IP office is you ask permission from uh, that division in the IP office in the UK in order for you to use the orphan work. And once they contact or once they know who the author is or who the composer is, then uh, they will link you to them and you, you, you can pay the proper royalties. So uh, one piece of advice is if you don't know the author or you cannot contact them, that does not mean that you can use it automatically, you no? Know, because um, some may want to be anonymous, you no? Know? Some may not put their details online. Some may not have Facebook or Twitter, so you cannot. So uh, exert earnest, earnest efforts to contact them. Probably you you may know some of the associations that are that they are with or friends or relatives. That shows good faith on your part. So for as long as you exerted earnest efforts to locate and uh, still you cannot um, locate no, the, the, the author or the composer, then try to use the fair use so that you are you are um, you have a proper defense. Because anyway, if even if you know the author, if it is under fair use, you can still use it no, under that doctrine. So it's it, it would be safer that way. What if the owner passed away, but it is not yet within the time range that makes it a mm -hmm. public domain? Yes, uh, just like any other property, uh, IP is uh, transferred to the heirs. So the estate of the person uh, would uh, own the copyright and if there is settlement of the estate and it is now transferred to the heirs, then the heirs will now uh, own the copyright and uh, you will now have to talk to the heirs. Okay. That's very interesting. Yeah. Um, again, this is a very interesting topic, but our time is very limited. Um, so we will probably take just one more question from the audience. Uh, you can feel free to chat it, whether you're on Facebook or Zoom. Um, this is definitely something that we would like to have another session on, and I hope that our organizers will consider that um, in the future. I think um, the topic is actually something that maybe people are overwhelmed with what they've been hearing. <laughs> Or, or, or probably uh, it's already lunchtime. They might be <laughs> off for lunch already. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's true. So, but thank you very much, Attorney Cruz, for yeah. for continuing this discussion on intellectual property rights. Um, it is definitely a topic that is foremost in the minds of many an artist, many a student artist, and many a, an arts administrator, particularly in a university uh, setting. Yep, thank you very much. Uh, I'm honored to be here. Uh, before we do wrap, wrap up, we would like to present you with uh, this certificate of appreciation. Once again, may we request our AUNCA chair, Ms. Glorifia Samodio, to turn on her camera for the awarding of certificate to our speaker. Thank you very much, Attorney Chris. Thank you. Let me read what the certificate says it's the ASEAN University Network, ASEAN University Network on Culture and the Arts, Commission on Higher Education, and the Association of Cultural Offices in Philippine Educational Institutions Incorporated present the Certificate of Appreciation to Attorney Christopher Cruz for generously sharing his insights as a parallel speaker on the topic of intellectual property laws 
for creative products under the theme, Managing the Arts and Empowering Young Artists in the New Normal Part Two for the AUNCA Crosslight Online Learning Session Day Three, given virtually this 18th day of June, 2021. Signed by Ms. Glorife Samodio, AUNCA Chair, and Dr. Charles Dirathiti, AUN Executive Director. Thank you very much, Attorney Cruz. Thank you. Thank you very much. Before you leave, one more thing. We would like to ask our audience this time to turn on their cameras for a quick photo op. Great. Thank you. All the best to you, Attorney Cruz. Thank you. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, this wraps up day three of Crosslight Online Learning Sessions. We hope to see you next week for our last of four sessions. Please note that the recordings of these sessions will be made available for the registrants at the closed FB groups we provided. You just have to join the groups and we will provide access. Take note also of the following. First, please take the time to tell us what you think of today's webinar by filling out the evaluation form which you can access by scanning the QR code that is now flashed on screen. Second, we have extended the call for abstracts, films and artworks for the exhibit for the Dialogues Research Forum and Crosslight Arts Festival on June 30, 5 p.m. Lastly, for all registered day four participants, please expect an email from us within the next few days regarding the Zoom link and other necessary streaming links. For more information, visit or follow AUN's official website, www.aunsec.org and the AUNCA official Facebook page. Once again, this has been Martin Lopez. Thank you for joining me for day three of Crosslight Online Learning Sessions. Have an excellent day and weekend ahead.
Ay, congrats po. Natanggal na silang lahat. <laughs> ah, wala na po. Okay na po. Congrats po. Ayun. Nice. Ay! Maraming maraming salamat. My gosh, natanggal. Ay, tawag dito. Uh, three weeks na tayong gano'n. <laughs> <laughs> Drop ko na yung call sa Viber, ha, mga sir. Ma'am, thank you. Okay, sige. So, uh, ano Yan. na lang, um, medyo simpler una tayo. Balik tayo sa simple next week. So, parang day two. So, anyway, okay for now, thank you very much. Pahinga na muna tayo. Salamat po sa mga taga-absu sa pagtulong. Maraming salamat, mga sir. Congrats, okay. congrats, mga sir. Congrats. Yes, Okay, Ayan sige po. po. Bye-bye. Sige po. Bye-bye po. Stop Bye-bye. recording po. Bye. Ayoko nga. <laughs>